Welcome to the Tax Alpha Solutions Podcast, hosted by Matt Chancy. Matt is a tax consultant, author, and certified financial planner with almost two decades helping his clients grow their net worth. On the show, Matt brings together an array of specialists to share with you their experience and success along with strategies of the 1%. Matt Chancy is with Coastal One, member FINRA SIPC. And now, here's your host, Matt Chancy. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Matt Chancy, and today is another episode of the Tax Alpha Solutions podcast. Today, we have a tax attorney uh, that focuses on trust, estates, and elder law. Um, and he is with um, Kelleher Holland, attorneys at law, Darren Mills, and he practices in Florida and New Jersey, um, CPA and attorney. Thanks so much for being on the podcast today, Darren. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. Well, you know, look, so when did you know that you wanted to be as nerdy as you are, because you're a CPA <laughs> and an attorney, when did you decide that that was what you wanted to be when you grew up? You know, the short answer is uh, my dad majored in accounting in the grad, never really, he never got a CPA or practice as an accountant. So he was, he was kind of pushing me to be an accountant or a CPA. And of course, then I didn't want to do it, right? Because <laughs> he wanted me to do it. But anyways, I majored, you know, ended up majoring in accounting undergrad. And, you know, the, the short story is I, I took auditing was a required class. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't imagine how people do this. And so uh, I signed a, sort of found myself rolling into tax and pretty much been doing that since I graduated in undergrad. I went to law school a little later in life. You know, so got my CPA. I also have a master's in tax, but then I went to law school. So I'm really a glutton for punishment. <laughs> you know, it's funny <laughs> because I um, overlap with so many attorneys and what my, my undergrad is in legal studies. And I thought about going back later in life to get a law degree, just so when I was talking to lawyers and the corporates goes, you know, of my everyday work, right. That I would right. just, when I was talking to them, I just go, Hey, I get it. I'm an attorney too. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, just to be able to say that one little piece of information, because, you know, many, especially younger, when I was younger in my career, you know, when you dealt with, you know, somebody that I guess has that higher professional status of an attorney per se, they tend to look down on you, you know, like I'm the smart guy in the room, I'm the attorney, which is okay. I got nothing wrong with that. Yep. Um, it's a measurable standard, which in the finance industry per se, there's not really a measurable standard of, hey, you've kind of reached the upper echelon of, of what you're doing per se, right? Yep, yep, exactly. So you got this tax background, you got this law background, um, highly specialized. So how are you using that skill set to serve your clients? What are you doing? Yeah, excellent question. So I, I think there's obviously a lot of, you know, trust and estate attorneys out there that are also CPAs, but having that financial acumen as a background, you know, being able to approach planning, not only from the estate and tax, from pardon me, the estate and gift tax perspective, but also from an income tax perspective, being able to look at balance sheets, financial statements, um, brokerage statements, right? And being able to understand, you know, where my clients, uh, you know, may be financially is important, obviously, um, and I think becomes beneficial. And, you know, a lot of attorneys will have an advanced degree in LLM and tax, or, you know, may be certified by the state bar or something. You know, for me, most people certainly know what a CPA is. And, you know, from a marketing perspective, you know, certainly helps to add uh, credentials. Well, they would clearly make the assumption when they see the credentials that, you know, they can talk to you about their legal or law concerns and you can look at it from that lens, but you can also look at it from the lens of, of a CPA with the tax emphasis and on it. And, you know, I, it's funny, I was having a conversation with somebody literally earlier today. I think the biggest issue with professional advisors is many of them don't speak the same language. And it's really a, a translation problem with the way they communicate things back and forth. And you kind of wear two of those hats and speak two different languages. And that has to be valuable. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and it's definitely, you know, it's an excellent point, right? It becomes a little bit of a learned art to be able to communicate to the client, 
you know, in terms they understand and to communicate between advisors, right? To make sure everybody understands as well. So yeah, that definitely critical. And I saw that when I when I looked you up and I read your background, I saw I think you CLU CHFC. So that's not really yeah. EPA or legal training. That's more kind of financial advisor ish to you know insurance type training stuff. How do you apply that knowledge and those skills in your day to day? Yeah. So when I decided, my background is you know working in large accounting firms. I was doing international tax, and when I decided I want to you know, go out on my own and practice law and get into trust and states and elder law. You know, I felt I had a little bit of a learning gap to try and close. And originally I was going to sit for CFP exam. And again, just from an educational standpoint, at the time I was like, well, I don't want to sit for another comprehensive exam. So I stumbled upon the American college and, you know, that's how I ended up with those designations. Um, the irony of the whole thing though, is like, you know, a couple of years later, when I decided I want to live and work in Florida, I had to sit for the Florida bar. So <laughs> as another, another, another comprehensive, comprehensive exam. exam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I understood. Well, and for those that, that don't know, um, the CLU and the CHFC is some of the same underlying curriculum that you would take for a CFP. The only difference is a comprehensive board final between the two of them. I have people all the time that ask me like, hey, I want to know some of this information. I'm like, well, one of the good ways to know what a kind of a cheat code is do one of those two things because you don't have to do that cumulative final at the end and test out on it per se. Right. Right. So a lot of stuff going on. CPA, attorney, you close the knowledge gap on the financial side. So what types of problems are, you know, you solving? And look, um, look, I think our audience base is going to know the fundamentals from trust in estates. We're going to know what a will is. We're going to know what probate is. You know, we're going to know those fundamental things, unless there's some nuance there you definitely want to bring up. But um, with your background, I would assume there's got to be some, you know, advanced planning opportunities for higher net worth, higher income clients to be able to lean into. And then um, a follow-up on this that I definitely want to know, um, elder law tends to be, in my viewpoint, and I want you to educate me on this, more of an asset protection type preservation play where and avoiding spin down from somebody in a long-term care scenario. And, and I know there are some tax implications there, but they're, to me, they don't seem to be as, uh, as challenging as it would be from some of the other planning that would be good. But I'd love to hear it from your perspective because that's my less educated perspective the way that I look at it. Sure, absolutely. And I mean, regarding the other law, yes. You know, the, the main driver there from a client perspective, right, is the asset protection. And I'm sure, as you know, right, most people don't have long-term care insurance. So, you know, what can we do from a legal standpoint to make sure they don't lose all of their assets to long-term care? Um, yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, going back to the first half of the, the question, you know, for a lot of clients that are owner-operators of their own business, and I'm sure, as you know, that, you know, 80% plus of their wealth is tied up in the business. So whether that's, you know, a service business, distribution, manufacturing, or it's real estate development, you know, if they, for a lot of those folks, even if they, you know, even with the new exemption going to 12920000 January, you know, for some of those folks, they'll still have potential exposure um, if they die next year or the year. 23, so they still have time before it sunsets in 2025. But you know, they still probably need to do some planning to make sure that if they, when they do pass, that they don't pay all of their, you know, or a good chunk, I should say, right, of their estate over to the IRS. And you know, some states have a still have an estate tax, right? So they may, depending on where they live, they may also have, you know, an estate estate tax due. So a lot of planning around that. And typically you bake into that planning, you know, a further additional asset protection planning, right? More from a creditor perspective. Um, sure. These people have amassed, you know, a significant amount of wealth, right? Want to make sure it's protected in case they ever get sued. And, you know, as I tell my clients, you know, my job is to put up as many roadblocks and hurdles as possible to a plaintiff's attorney so that, 
you know, it, it's not worth their while to try and get to the assets and, you know, settle the item more quickly. We're in a perfect world, make them judgment proof, which is kind of hard, but um, that's also why well, I live here in Florida and Florida is a very debtor friendly state. So you could get almost judgment proof in Florida. It's very debtor friendly. I come from New Jersey and it's, and it's not the same. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. Well, that's why do you think everybody from New Jersey moves to Florida? Because it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. Exactly. <laughs> Although I got to tell you, it's a little chilly this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Geographically, where are you based? I uh, live in Palm Beach Gardens, so I'm on the East Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I went to the gym this morning, it was 63 degrees. I'm in Orlando today. And when I woke up, it was 52. And I thought the same thing. Yeah. I was like, where did this come from? <laughs> I know, crazy. <laughs> crazy, you know? right? And that sounds funny because we're just as Floridians. We're not prepared for that anymore. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's only October 19th. You know, for January, it wouldn't be so, you know, but yeah. Understood. So let's dig into that a little bit. You know, you talked about business owners, real estate developers, their key assets are really not market-based assets like stocks and bonds. And I think that's what a lot of people think of per se, when they think about people with assets, but business owners and real estate developers don't think about stocks and bonds and stuff like that as their assets. It's their businesses and the real estate and stuff that they've developed and protecting those assets from the potential estate taxes becomes even more critical because I would argue the issue of illiquidity of those assets. Exactly. Right. So, and I'm sure, as you know, in those scenarios, if, you know, if the folks, if they're married couple, um, if they're both insurable, you know, potentially doing a second to die policy, putting it into an irrevocable life insurance trust, some practitioners will put the life insurance into a slot. My personal preference is just to use an islet, keep everything separate, just being conservative. And so the insurance can definitely be very, very powerful planning tool for when the second of them die and ultimately there may be you know money that has to be sent into the irs for those folks living in florida we don't have an estate tax or an inheritance tax so they don't have to worry about the state of florida but uh, with the amount of wealth moving here to florida there's certainly a lot of folks that have some estate tax exposure yeah absolutely i mean they're coming you know in the past few years, I joke and sometimes say, you know, for a long time, I was considered a dumb Southerner. It turns out I was just early. Um, <laughs> you know, now everybody yeah. wants to be here because of, you know, the the warm weather, right? And the beaches, which are great, unless a hurricane's coming. But, you know, the the tax environment, the asset protection or creditor protection environment that you talked about before, you know, and I think now over the past few years with the pandemic and everything, we've gotten the the political climate that we're in and how we've, how we manage, you know, businesses and other stuff. I just think some of the, uh, some of the other big cities and especially the Northeast or the Midwest, some people have kind of lost their love of those places and how they handle those circumstances and situations. Yeah. I mean, you know, where I am here in, you know, in the West Palm area, they're starting to call it the Wall Street of the South, right? You have all these private equity and hedge funds that are moving into the area. You know, the construction, the building of office buildings in West Palm is crazy. And they fit and they're getting filled, right? So it's it's good for business, you know, driving around and getting from place to place is becoming a little bit more tougher. But, you know, from putting money into the, you know, the economy and the community, it's it's all good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, you don't have the state of New York and New Jersey taking what, 10% bite out of everything. <laughs> yeah. In New Jersey, if uh, in New Jersey is a gross income tax state, so there's not a lot of deductions allowed. Basically you get, you know, your a real estate deduction, medical deduction, that's really it. And then, you know, a million dollars taxable income, you got 10% tax rate. So. Yeah, that's brutal. You know, California's yep. California's the same way. I have clients that move out of California and and uh, you know, same exact thing, you know, the top marginal tax being like I guess 13% on stuff. And you're like, man, that's that's a big bite for the state to look. If you thought they redeployed the funds in an efficient way and it made sense, uh, that's one thing. But I don't think too many, and I don't want to get too much into politics because that's a different right. deal. But I yeah. don't think people agree with the with the way the states are using the money today that they are taking from taxation. And if they did, I think they would be more open to that, but I don't think that they believe the the way they use it. 
No, no. You know, and I said this, I say this to people all the time, as I mentioned earlier, I used to do international tax and most people really have no idea, frankly, how good we have it. You know, our tax burden is nowhere near what it is in a lot of our trading partners countries, you know, so, but anyways, a story for a different day. Sure, sure. And not only the yeah. tax, but quality of life and standard of living, right? If you've gone to any yeah. of those places and traveled, I've lived in a couple of places this is in South America for extended periods of time. And you're like, you know, um, when they show the optics on a country like Brazil, they, they don't really talk about like the disparity between the wealthy and poor, you know, as much as it's evident when you're there and you see it firsthand. So, you know, we don't, you know, the, the poor people in our country, by whatever standard you measure it, and I get it, they're so, they, they still do pretty well. It's a higher standard. Oh, yeah. Yep, absolutely. So talk about a little bit and look, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, we've opened Pandora's box. I don't want to let all the secrets out of the trick bag, but, you know, <laughs> but if you could a little bit, you know, uh, tickle the listeners ears a little bit with some of the opportunities that are out there and some of the fancy planning that maybe they are unfamiliar with and you won't have to get into the mechanics of it per se a little bit, but just from a concept level, what might be available, how these things might work a little bit and to say, <clears> Hey, <throat> if this is my problem, there might be a solution to it, which which some people may not even realize it's a problem. So maybe just listening alone will let them know that, hey, I have a tax problem that I wasn't aware of. Sure. So, you know, and, then, and this is where folks like yourself are certainly, you know, helpful taking some of these existing. Uh, now, of course, if it's e-liquid assets and it's a business, it gets a little more harder to project out a future value. But, you know, if somebody's got a portfolio, right, you can do certain assumptions and say, okay, you're, you know, your portfolio is worth $10 million today, you know, 30 years from now, based on historical returns will be, you know, worth X, right? And generally, although the estate exemption is indexed, it's not going to typically keep pace with, you know, hopefully the return on investment with your, you know, portfolio or whatever your assets are. So at some point, even though you may not have much of an estate tax liability right now, and I mentioned earlier, in 2023, the estate tax exemption index for inflation will be $12,920,000 per taxpayer. So double that for married couple called 26 million. You know, so if they die, if they're at a $25 million estate and they, you know, both, God forbid, die in a car accident next year, they are not gonna have an estate issue, but you know, if they have another 30 years to go and their portfolio keeps growing, two things, one, as of right now, on December 31st of 2025, the increased exemption that came in in 2017 is going to sunset. So it's going to go back to $5 million indexed for inflation. So on January 1 of 2026, you know, let's just assume that the exemption is $7 million per taxpayer. So the important point there, Matt, you know, it's a use it or lose it you have this increased exemption, if you don't take advantage of that difference, right, um, it's gone, right? You don't have the opportunity to use it. So, you know, many people, I know I'm diverging a little bit, but, you know, people tend to procrastinate, right? So I think the important thing for people to understand right now is if they have a certain amount of net worth, you know, call it $25 million, or it's less, but they expect it to, you know, to grow fairly rapidly. It, the timing, you know, now is not necessarily a bad time to do some planning, even though you may be able to kind of, most people may want to wait and see, because again, people procrastinate, but, you know, values could be depressed right now. And so from a gift tax standpoint, you know, what otherwise might be worth a million dollars is only worth seven hundred. dollars you know, $50,000 right now. So it may make sense to move those assets now into some kind of an irrevocable trust. For married couples, you know, SLATs, the Spousal Lifetime Access Trust are extremely popular because of its flexibility. So for example, you know, husband sets up a SLAT for the wife, puts assets into the SLAT, the wife has access to the income, if there's a certain kind of need, the trustee could dip into 
the trust and make certain distributions to the wife for what we call health education, maintenance and support. And that would get the assets out of the estate, you know, you maximize the use of the current higher exemption. So you don't use, uh, lose it, pardon me. And so you've moved wealth out of your taxable estate and preserved it for, you know, if you have kids, you know, preserved it for the kids, right? Without necessarily, you know, giving up complete control, which is a big issue for a lot of folks, right? And that's why slats are so, so prevalent, you know, because of those kind of reasons, the flexibility and not necessarily having to, you know, basically turn the assets over to the kids and give up complete control. Yeah, makes sense. So following that logic a little bit on that, let me ask you a question. If if liquid marketable assets are down 30% because bonds have moved in the wrong direction on us with interest rates and equities have moved in the wrong direction because of, let's just say valuations, right? So do you think the same could be, and so so those assets are down 30%, so a million dollars is worth 700,000. Maybe it's getting their investment advisor fired. Maybe it's not, but it's definitely yeah. causing some hard conversations. But that does create an opportunity for them to potentially, if they believe in their guy and they believe their money is going to come back ultimately, it gives them the ability to move those dollars out today at a 30% discount, which then they'll appreciate back outside of their estate, which is good planning, right? Correct. Correct. So let me ask you this question. Would the same be true on an illiquid asset from a valuation standpoint today? Could you justify a discount based on the economic factors that have affected the public markets? Could that justify discounts in the private markets? It's going to depend on the industry, you know, whatever bus- you know, business that industry is in. You know, yes, it certainly is definitely possible, right? that there could be, you know, pressure, you know, people are talking about whether or not the M&A activity, you know, is going to start to slow down. I, I was talking to a partner in a private equity fund recently, and, you know, his view was, yes, thing, he's seeing things starting to slow down. So, you know, if money tightens up, it's not as free, right? There might be less premiums paid for businesses and things like that. You know, that may enable, and typically, Right. When you have a, a privately held business, you know, you're going to have a valuation done because you want to be able to substantiate what that value is for gift tax purposes in case of an audit by the IRS. And then, you know, knock on wood, as we you know, stand here today, although the original Build Back Better Act was going to attack some of this stuff, you can still take a discount for, you know, lack of marketability lack of control and sometimes those discounts you know you use 30 percent before right on somebody's portfolio sometimes those discounts get to be 30 percent and again becomes powerful planning right you're basically moving an asset worth you know in a third party hands if you sold in a third party it's called a hundred dollars you know under the valuation rules and what the tax law allows you're transferring it for seventy dollars, so only using seventy of your exemption, but you've already got a hundred dollars out of your estate, and then you know the business or the asset continues to appreciate, and it's you know growing outside your taxable estate, you know which becomes obviously real money, right? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, if, yeah, if you're having if you're having these kind of conversations with clients about the ability to discount the value of an asset through uh, you know control or marketability, you're dealing with real money anyway. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> that conversation True. doesn't come up with a mass affluent client. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, to, but to your point, right. So it, 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 there, there are multiple factors. So we've got, you know, so, so in a perfect world, a great planning strategy and not to lean into the procrastination of humans issue, which is certainly a thing. Um, you know, if, if a state tax thresholds escalate or indexed for the next three, four or five years, and then in 2025, 2026, that sunsets and they get cut in half by 50%. And then today, right now, assets are, uh, you know, pulled 
decreased by 30%. I mean, you're almost talking about in a perfect world, the dip in value would have happened in 2025 in a perfect world, right? Because that would have been an indexed right. you know, estate tax yep. as high as it could be. And then assets dropped by 30%. You're, you're basically you know, squeezing the value of something down and jamming it through a smaller tube at the very last minute would be the perfect planning opportunity, but there's never the perfect time to plan, right? No, exactly. And, you know, I, I mentioned this to somebody this morning at a chamber event. You know, I said, you know, kids don't go to law school to be tax attorneys or trust and estate attorneys. You know, they just don't, you know, some do like myself, but, you know, most kids will end up perhaps migrating into the area. But, you know, most kids going into law school are going into be litigators or corporate attorneys and M&A, things like that. Right. And so, you know, the point there, and this happened back in 2020, as people were panicking about what was going to happen, you know, after Biden won the election, right, what was going to happen with the estate tax, there was a flurry of activity. And, you know, for those people that procrastinate, and if you wait till 2025, you may find yourself on the sidelines at the end of the day, because there just may not be enough trust in the state attorneys to get the work done. Um, so that's another factor. You know, it's just a practical factor. The other thing too, you know, obviously, as you know, that's happening right now. And, you know, the Fed's talking, right? We already saw another potential 75 basis points. You know, so obviously, as interest rates are going up, the IRS is raising, you know, what we would call the AFR, the applicable federal rate. And, you know, sometimes in a planning context, you know, going back to a SLAT, or an intentionally defective grant or trust, which you know essentially a slat is, people may sell assets to that slat, you know, in exchange for a note. And you know, the rate we use on the note is the applicable federal rate, which you know was at historical lows, you know, 18 months ago. Well, as it continues to creep up, you know, what that does is it puts pressure on you know the assets that go into the trust to outpace you know, that fixed rate. So you're shifting value and wealth from, you know, the individual taxpayer to the trust, you know, so again, as interest rates creep up, you know, that becomes a bigger challenge in that kind of a planning technique, you know, so yeah, you know, grats are in the other, you know, uh, grats are still, you know, fairly prevalent, you know, grant to retain the annuity trust. Um, similar kind of concept, you know, you set up an irrevocable trust, you transfer assets to it, and that trust will pay an annuity back to you. You can do it, you know, you can do a two-year grad, I mean, 10 years. I mean, there's some, there's planning out there to do a 99-year grad, depending on interest rates and stuff. But, you know, typically people use shorter-term grads because, you know, if the grantor or the taxpayer dies before the grad finishes paying back out the annuity, there will be some estate tax inclusion. Um, but, and hence the reason, you know, people will tend to do these short-term grats. But yeah, they're still still out there. You know, not to get overly complicated, there's some proposed regs from the IRS that right now still kind of make a slap maybe arguably more preferential depending on the situation than a grat, you know, if these proposed regs get finalized. But, you know, again, we'll have to kind of see. And again, for most, most married couples, they lean towards the slat anyways because they like the benefits of it. And earlier I mentioned that, you know, the life insurance trust, right? I mean, that's kind of just block attacking stuff, setting up, you know, the eyelet as it's affectionately called, funding it with the life insurance. And it's just a great liquidity tool. Sure. You keep in your estate what's not taxed. You transfer out what would be taxed. You attempt to do that at the best discounts potentially possible. And then you buy life insurance outside of the estate for additional liquidity to pay the taxes if and when those events occur. Right, exactly. Or And you put that all together in some shape, form or fashion and see what you get, right? 
Yep. Because <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody, yeah. everybody, you know, the discounting stuff and it doesn't work and, you know, for everybody and not everybody qualifies for life insurance from a health standpoint. So not everybody can use all of these tools per se. So you use, there are a basket of tools that are on the table that are available for you, but based on your fact pattern and your circumstances, it may eliminate, you know, the use of some of these tools or the efficacy of some of these tools, right? Exactly. Exactly. You know, and it is, but it, there's the factors, like you said, whether or not somebody's insurable. Um, and then just really a numbers exercise, right? Based on certain assumptions, you know, what's the anticipated growth of the asset? And the other piece, too, is, you know, almost always the estate tax, again, depending on the person's situation, but what assets do go into the trust, right? If they have low basis, high value assets, maybe some of those they keep in their name. So, you know, as one of my tax professors said, death is the best income tax planning, but it comes with a high cost. Yep. So, you know, they get the basis step. Of course, you can always get a basis step down, but the basis step up on death. And then basically those assets can be sold for, if they're sold immediately thereafter, right? Pretty much no gain or loss for income tax purposes. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. terrible that you have to die to get the step up. But it's, a, <laughs> it's a reasonable planning technique for some of your assets that especially have low basis for sure. Yep. Yep. You know, so, I mean, that's part of the going into the mix too, right? You know, what does somebody's personal financial statement look like? What do they need to live on? Right. People, I know, I know this is, you know, surprising, but right. For most people as their wealth accumulates, their lifestyle changes, right? So they become accustomed to living a certain type of lifestyle. And so planning around that too, right? It's going to be factored in. Yeah, the income's um, got to, we, we live on income, not assets. So the income has to come from somewhere. If you're not actively earning it, your assets are generating it, right? What, what is that coming right. from? Is it coming from a debt instrument? Is it, is it coming from dividends? Is it coming from, you know, the interest in a, in a company, maybe in a passive capacity or something? Like, yeah, where's the, where's the income coming from to live off of, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right. You know, lean into that a little bit because um, uh, I'm pretty familiar with what you're talking about here, but you brought up the term intentionally defective. And I have literally been at a conference where, you know, somebody said that at a conference and we walked out in the hallway and somebody said, why would they make a trust that was intentionally defective when they made it? Um, so clearly <laughs> that's not what it is. Um, but talk about that for just a second. Why? So what it is and why someone would leave something intentionally defective. Yeah, sure. Excellent question. So uh, just to step back for a second, right? So in the U.S., we have two different, uh, you know, tax systems, right? We have an income tax system and a transfer wealth tax system. And when you set up a trust, a trust can be a separate tax paying entity. And a trust will hit a 37% tax bracket it just got indexed now to whatever it is, 14,000, so 14,000 something. And so versus a married couple, when they'll hit the top tax bracket is now almost $700,000, right? And so you have that difference in the brackets and that can become permanent tax savings, right? Because the sooner you hit the highest tax bracket, obviously, you know, economically, the more money you're paying out to you know the IRS in this case. And so an intentionally defective grant or trust, I to me is an oxymoron. The reason being is that Congress years and years ago, right, people would use trusts to basically avoid, you know, income tax because the personal income tax brackets were so high. And so they would put income into a trust and save money. So Congress created what we call the grant or trust rules. And when you have a grantor trust, that means for tax purposes that the grantor is effectively taxed on that income. It's as if it doesn't exist for income tax purposes. And those rules are, frankly, are kind of hard to plan out of, which is why when people say an intentionally defective grantor trust, to me, it's almost an oxymoron because it's hard to plan or it's hard to get out of the grantor trust rules. So, and that was done on, you know, designed by Congress. So the reason you use an intentionally defective grant or trust is it, you get 
the best of both worlds. You move an asset out of some of these taxable estate, you know, hopefully depreciation continues to appreciate outside the taxable estate inside the trust. And then since the trust for income tax purposes is deemed not to exist, the grantor on their personal return is picking up the income from the trust and they're going to have to cut a check to the IRS. And so by doing that, you know, they're also shifting wealth because the IRS has ruled that in that scenario, it's not a gift. And so, you know, you can pay, the grantor can pay the income tax to reduce their gross estate and we're shifting more value to the trust and the beneficiaries. So that's, you know, the benefit of the intentional, intentionally defective grantor trust. Sure, sure. And then obviously the the assets that are in the trust make a big difference because if it's something that's generating, you know, uh, like a bond fund per se, just hypothetical that's generating 5% income on $10 million worth of assets, that's $500,000 a year in income that's now fully taxable to the grantor of it. But if it were something like, and has limited upside, but if it were stocks per se, with like just say a dividend per se of 2% on the stocks, well, stocks have still have the ability to appreciate outside of the estate. And now you're only talking about $200,000 of potentially taxable income as opposed to 500. So the asset mix in that planning matters as well. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, Good. Interesting. Hear that come up. And it's, it's funny, like, cause just something about when you tell somebody something's intentionally defective, they're like, why would you make it broken like that? <laughs> right. Right. Again, to me, it's an oxymoron, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. So let me ask you this. I mean, look, I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people and um, you look like a linebacker, but you don't talk like one. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. how do people find you? How, I mean, w- with everything that you do today, how do you find, I know some attorneys have, uh, you know, their primary relationships are built with financial people, financial advisory types or whatever, and they help educate them to understand that they're, that you're a tool and a resource and they work off of referrals from them. So I'm sure that's probably part of your business model, maybe to some extent, but how do clients find you and know the, know about the value you can bring? Yeah. Excellent question. So. Attorneys can advertise, actually, for relatively speaking, for the longest time, attorneys could not advertise. That was prohibited under the ethics rules. You know, that's changed. There's still restraints on how attorneys can advertise and what you can say. But, you know, yes, for folks like myself, you know, folks like yourself are, you know, big referral sources, you know, other financial advisors, CPAs, you know, just getting out and and networking, doing speaking engagements, things like that. People, you know, for a lot of people, they've never had to deal with an attorney other than maybe a real estate closing or what have you, right? So, you know, they may not know, you know, even where to start. So they may start by asking, you know, who somebody else used, right? But again, financial advisors can be great because if they're doing comprehensive financial planning, will typically ask about estate planning and making sure they have their documents in place. And, you know, if they're doing, you know, projections or whatever, they're going to talk about the estate tax. And truthfully, sometimes other attorneys are great referral sources, right? Because I mentioned earlier, kids don't go to law school to be, you know, tax attorneys, right? So a lot of my friends that are attorneys, you know, refer work my way because I jokingly say they don't know how to spell tax, right? So, I mean, that's pretty much sort of the basic way, you know, the typical other stuff, right? You know, SEO marketing, Google, LinkedIn, right? You know, so that people, people can find you. And so. Well, refer, you know, look, referrals are the best business. Everybody knows that. It comes with a word of mouth blessing from somebody that you trust. You know, that's a great way. The reason I bring that up from a curiosity standpoint is we did mention earlier in here that, you know, owner operators of businesses and real estate developers tend to be great clients for this type of planning. And I don't disagree with that at all. But the reason I bring up the financial part from an intellectual curiosity standpoint is many of those people don't really hire financial advisor types because if if they built their wealth in a business and they understand their return on equity or their return on capital in their business or from real estate, the last thing they want to do is stick it in something as volatile as the stock market. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Right. I mean, you know, certainly have many clients that are worth, you know, 
a lot, a lot, a lot of money, but they may only have 500,000 in investments, right? You know, because they just, you know, 85% plus the value of their estate is in the business. You know, again, that, that kind of comes back to just other attorneys that may be doing the corporate work and may have conversations with them about, hey, look, you know, you really need to talk to a trust and estate attorney and make sure your affairs are in order. Even, even you know, like just the block and tackling stuff. You got a durable power of attorney. I mean, if you can't, you wake up when they're you know, driving home from work one day, you get a car accident. You can't make a decision. Who's going to run the business? Sure. Right. So all those kind of things, you know, having that in place, but yeah. Well, that's what you have to communicate to those business owner type clients, right? You're like, look, you're, you're a different breed, but I know that if you wake up, dress up and show up for the next 30 years or whatever it is, everything's going to be all right. But the real risk is that one day you can't wake up, dress up or show up because of death or incapacity. And then what happens to everything? Yep. And, and that's the planning that needs to be had when you're having that conversation. So yeah, and it goes, you know, in, in succession planning, right? I mean, less and less children want the business, right? You yeah. know, if they want the business, they may take it, but then <laughs> they they basically monetize it shortly thereafter, right? Yeah, um, they want the economic so, resources of the business. They don't want the headaches to come with figuring out how to right. run. Exactly. Business, right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Understood, agreed yeah. on that one. Well, Darren, hey, I really appreciate it. We're kind of running a little bit on, on close to the end of our time here. So, um, you know, while we're here looking, we're going to put all your contact information at the bottom of it to make sure that everybody can find you uh, that listen to the podcast today. And this was extremely valuable for the clients that fall into the into the fact patterns that need this information. I think we took a definitely a deeper dive than what I normally do on some of these. I think your skill set just uh, leaned into that opportunity. But tell people how they would find you. Yeah, sure. You know, they can, I'm on LinkedIn. So Darren Mill, you know, Darren J. Mills, like I said, I, I do look like an old school middle linebacker, you know, uh, from a firm's website, which is kellerhairholland.com, um, you know, Facebook. I mean, it's easy enough nowadays, right? You know, oftentimes I have people, new clients call and I always ask them, where'd you find me? And they're like, oh, Google. So. Well, you must be yeah. doing something right there on Google. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody's doing something right. Exactly. <laughs> your, Google, your Google guy's doing a good job if that's how they're finding. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Hopefully some of these assets are useful or beneficial for you and, and uh, somebody can go on and, and hear this. You know, what I hear all the time from clients is, um, you know, they just, they're, these conversations can be somewhat intimidating to have to walk in first time and not know a ton about it. So to have a little bit of a lead in and go, oh, there's some stuff that can be done. And here's some of the names of it, and whatever these things are. I think those things are, are really beneficial. So great that people are finding you, you know, maybe, maybe this is an asset that people could listen to ahead of time before they come and go, Hey, this Darren's the right guy. I know he looks like a linebacker, but he doesn't sound like one. <laughs> Actually, ironically, you know, I usually get with people people try and guess what I do, you know, it's anything from, you know, a cop, state trooper, military, CIA. I'm like, you're never going to guess ever. <laughs> yeah. Ever. <laughs> I, I get it. I understand. No, trust me. I, yeah. I feel your pain. I'm not a tax attorney and a CPA, but I, this is the kind of stuff I do all day, every day as well. And so people don't typically peg me for being that person. That's why I, I can yep. <laughs> Very good. Well, Darren, very entertaining. Uh, appreciate the time today. Very educational as well. Um, I think this will be a great resource, great asset for a lot of the clients and people that I talk with. Uh, but um, thanks so much for taking the time to jump on the podcast today. All right, Matt. Appreciate you having me. You got it. So everybody, today's episode, uh, this was Darren Mills, CPA, uh, tax attorney and trust estate elder law asset protection, Florida and New Jersey. And um, this was another episode of the Tax Alpha Solutions podcast. I hope you learned something today and we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of Tax Alpha Solutions brought to you by Matt Chansey. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and insight. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts.